Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on our webinar today on re redefining traditional students. My name is Kate Ronnie Janzi, and I am the Chief Acad Academic Officer here at Science Interactive. For those of you who are new to us or those of you who um, are getting reacquainted with us, Science Interactive has been the leader in online education, online science education, um, for over 30 years, uh, we provide science laboratory kits and curriculum to remote students across the country. Our mission is very simple. We believe that remote science students deserve to have access to hands-on laboratory experiments that are as effective as on-campus laboratories. In our 30 years of experience, we have worked with over 1,100 colleges and universities to provide over half a million students with a remote laboratory experience in 10 different disciplines, ranging from geology and the earth sciences to biology, chemistry, physics, and higher levels such as A&P and micro. And we take pride in the fact that we've been able to serve these half million students with our hands-on kits, our cloud platform, and our curriculum. Now, before I introduce our speakers today, I want to set the stage uh, for our topic, um, starting with why we want to focus on redefining traditional students. Um, that really starts with a larger view of overall trends in higher education. Um, specifically, we want to talk about declining enrollments. And I'm sure you've heard about this a ton over the past few years, either on your own campus or in the news, that college enrollments are down across the board. And while there was a significant plummet during COVID and a lot of the uh, news articles have really focused in on that plummet from COVID, this trend really dates back further to the mid 2010s. So why are we seeing a, a, a significant decline in college enro enrollment? There are a number of reasons for this, but today I really wanna focus on a recent study that came out of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation called Exploring the Exodus from Higher Education. Um, in this survey, they polled a number of recent high school graduates who decided not to pursue higher education, as well as students who had pursued higher education as a traditional student and ultimately dropped out and didn't return to school. And through this um, uh, polling and the study, they identified a number of reasons why students um, didn't pursue higher education. Um, some that might seem very obvious and some that don't necessarily um, seem obvious. The first and the foremost, it's the cost of college. We all know that college costs have soared. Um, we are all working very hard to find ways to cut costs for students, make college more affordable. But part and parcel of that is actually um, what students call return on investment. In the study by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they found that while about 40% of students feel that there is a very high ROI um, when it comes to their college education, an equal amount feel that the return on investment isn't there because of those very high costs of school. The second um, thing brought up by students is the strong, in part and parcel with each other, the strong labor market and that they're content in their current situation. Right now, there's a lot of job opportunity out there. They're content with the jobs they have. They like the opportunity to pursue a career and they're not necessarily looking to come back to school. And then the third thing that's brought up by the students is anxiety and the pressure of earning a college degree not so much from the cost, but from the emotional aspect of um, pursuing a higher education. So what does this really mean? Part of the study is that this um, was a probe of students um, to see what they would find helpful in returning to college. And a number of items were asked about, but there were three in particular I wanted to hone in on. The first, um, what they did in the study, um, was looked at the potential supports that could be helpful for a student returning to school and whether a student found them extremely helpful, very helpful, um, or not helpful. And what they found was that when it came to um, higher education, uh, students found that being able to get more education without additional debt would be extremely helpful. 53% um, said extremely helpful, 75% um, said extremely or very. No surprises there really, right? Um, but the second one that I found very interesting was having more flexibility in your, in your programs fit to your life. 76% of students found that that would be extremely or very helpful. And probably the most interesting statistics that came out of this was that among these uh, either former traditional or students that would be traditional learners in that 18 to 24 demographic, knowing that your classes would be all in person was actually the lowest in um, had the lowest number of respondents listing it as extremely or very helpful. Only 44% of students felt that in-person classes 
um, would be helpful to them returning to school. So what does that really mean? As we look at what redefining the traditional student means, we're seeing and move towards online education and online opportunities. One of the most interesting articles I've encountered recently was out of Inside Higher Ed um, regarding enrollments in exclusively online programs are up, in some cases more than doubling among the traditional 18 to 24 student demographic. And in my conversations with, um, with, uh, with a number of faculty across the country this year, one of the most staggering anecdotes I've heard in every corner of the country is that enrollments are down, but online courses are maxing out. Students wanna be online. And so what we really wanted to dive into today is um, whether that's really happening on campus. We're hearing it, we're seeing it in the news, but what's the real situation on campus and it is online where the students wanna be. And so I'm very excited to introduce our panelists that are gonna be joining us today. Cheston Saunders from Southeastern Community College and Sujatha Kadaba. Um, from uh, Empire State College. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Cheston. Would you mind introducing yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, so I'm Cheston Saunders. I, I've taught biology for a number of years here at Southeastern Community College. Um, I'm looking forward to working with all of you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up teaching laboratories online? Sure. Um, so when I was in graduate school a number of years ago, that was about the time that online homework systems started coming about. So not lab kits so much, but online homework systems from publishers. And I kind of thought that we're going to shift more online eventually as technology advances. So I took a class called technology integration, and we talked a lot in that class about emerging technologies and how to fit those into a class. So my final project for that class was I designed an online biology course. And I went to my department chair at that time when I was in graduate school and I asked about, could we possibly teach this? And at that time, my department chair said, no, we're never gonna teach biology online. It has to be in person. Um, we're never gonna see online labs ever. And then I went, I graduated and I went to a community college and in my interview, they asked about online education. So I talked a little bit about how I designed this class and they were like, oh goodness, we've got to hear more about that. So it kind of came about from this idea of, I saw technology coming forward from textbook publishers. And I said, people are gonna get on board with this and run with it. So that's just kind of how I ended up teaching online. Awesome, thanks. And Sujatha, can uh, you tell us a little bit more about yourself and what led you to teaching labs online? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sujata Kadaba and I have uh, I am a biology instructor at SUNY Empire State College and also the coordinator for online lab kits. Uh, so uh, Empire State Online has been uh, uh, in the online field for a long time, not necessarily before the pandemic. Uh, so when I first joined uh, Empire State, I was, um, looking for an opportunity to uh, uh, learn about this emerging uh, or a new uh, facet in education. And I was uh, given the opportunity to revise a microbiology course. And uh, that is how I uh, ended up teaching online. And also I started adopting uh, lab kits, which was really interesting to me. Uh, to see how students can work on these labs at home. Uh, and since then I have designed several online classes uh, with lab kits and uh, it's been pretty interesting to see how students, um, traditional as well as non-traditional uh, fare in these classes. Thank you. Awesome, thank you guys. So let's dive into our question answer session. And so where I wanted to start today is um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a lot of um, information now about how more traditional students um, are looking for an online experience. But I know both of you were teaching labs um, prior to the pandemic online. Would you consider prior to the pandemic that your students were traditional, non-traditional, or a mix of both? Okay, so for me, 
I had a mix of, of those, but predominantly my online students were what I would consider non-traditional students prior to the pandemic. Most of my students, I felt like my traditional 18 to 22 year olds were in my face-to-face -face classes. Most of my working adults were in my online classes. Did you see something similar, Sajatha? Yes, I also saw the same thing uh, before the pandemic. Uh, my online students were mostly non-traditional and uh, the traditional students always prefer to come in person. Uh, but now we are seeing a little bit more uh, inclination towards online for the traditional students as well. Awesome. So now I'm very curious based on that. Obviously, when COVID happened and everything shut down, you have your non-traditional students right in the mix of using their lab kits and interacting with the lab kits. And maybe these traditional students are moving to an off-campus lab experience for the first time. Did you see if any issues with students in adapting to online in that first semester? Or did you have to adapt how you supported these students? Uh, for me, I think the biggest difference I saw was my non-traditional students were really much better at time management because they, one, were working in a career. So they have a, that career background of this is how I need to lay things out to make a goal. Um, my other issue I saw was my, my new students that were traditional college age weren't good at that time management aspect. They needed more support for that. So I had to build in more kind of scaffolding. And I also saw some differences with technology ability, ability right? So one of the biggest I issues I saw with my students who normally took online classes, they knew how to save a file. They knew how to upload a file. They knew how to rename documents. I was surprised to find that most of my traditional age younger students were much more limited when it came to things that I considered basic PC literacy. They were really good at like one assignment I had them make a TikTok video. They loved that. They knocked that out of the park. But earlier, some of the earlier sort of assignments where it involved downloading a file, renaming it, that kind of thing, they were much worse than my non-traditional students. So I had to kind of chunk information and make shorter videos of this is how you do basic PC literacy, things that I've expected them to know already. Oh my goodness, I would not have expected that. I, you know, adjusting to the lab is one thing, adjusting to a computer was not what I would have expected. Um, Sujata, how about on your end? What, what difference did you see in students? Um, so as uh, Cheston said, my non, I didn't see much difference with my non-traditional students, but because they were already prepared for online learning, they were already taking online classes before. So it was not very different for them anyway. Um, but with my traditional students, uh, I agree that uh, some of them were barely able to use Blackboard. So they did not know the basics of LMS, how to use it. Uh, how how to access things. Um, actually, uh, it was opposite to what I expected because these were young students, so I thought they were technologically savvy and they should not have any problem adjusting to online learning. But uh, I think the first time uh, they jumped into this online learning, they really faced a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. And for faculty also, it was very challenging. We had to you know, work with them. Uh, sometimes I felt like I was dealing with all the tech issues that my students were having <laughs> more than actually teaching them. So it it, it got a little frustrating in the beginning, but um, eventually I think they did get used to it. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's so striking to think, you know, you think one way where, where things are gonna be very easy and it's like, it takes you aback when that happens. Um, and it's not what you expect. So it sounds like though for both of you, as the students proceeded through the semester, as they had the opportunity to dive into the LMS and into the, the lab case, they were able to adjust. They adjusted over time and, it, and things worked out in the end. Yes, I, I definitely say that it worked out in the end. Uh, one of the biggest differences I saw with that was they were used to on uh, in camp on campus labs where they could ask a question in the middle of a lab, right? So when they're mm -hmm. doing this lab at home, right, they can still email me, ask me questions, but they don't get that instant question answer thing that they mm -hmm. were used to. So we had to talk more about time management, right? So yep. planning this early on in the in the week, so that way if you do encounter a question, you can get an answer in a timely manner. 
For sure. Oh, definitely. So I'm very curious. Um, I don't know how long you guys were largely working online, um, but as um, fall 2020 rolled around, spring 2021 rolled around, whenever you went back to campus, um, did you see the traditional students really rushing to return to campus or were there at least, was there interest in staying online? Yeah, so for us, we had we're a community college, so we were really interested in looking at student success and trying to meet the needs of the students. So our administration was very gung ho about reducing the number of online classes and sort of trying to filter students. So your traditional college age students were in seated classes and your online students were your non traditional. Um, that was met with actually more resistance than we were expecting, right? So a lot of wow. the students who were online to begin with, they said, well, we, we want to keep staying online. I mean, that's not across the board, but for a good number, we were not expecting as many students to want to stay online as really we, we did see. And was that in your, your lecture classes or the labs as well? That was in both. Wow. <laughs> did you see something similar, Sajatha? Yeah, so um, we saw that uh, right after the pandemic, when we uh, when we returned to in-person campus, uh, this the enrollment was really down for in-person classes. Students uh, continued to stay online, uh, but now this semester we are seeing uh, pretty much back to what it was before the pandemic. Everybody wants to come in person and. Uh, we still offer a lot of online classes, but mm -hmm. um, the traditional students are inclining to come back to campus. Interesting. So Cheston, as a follow-up on your side, since you guys have seen that increased interest in um, the traditional students staying online, um, what reasons are they giving for that? Are they, is it um, related to employment or family or flexibility? What, why are they interested in staying online? So that's a great question. So. I, I asked some of my students sort of informally, and it's really that idea of, I think, freedom and flexibility, right? So they've gotten a taste of it, and now they're kind of like, oh, this is great. I can do this kind of at home on my own pace. And many of them, I think, started getting jobs sooner mm -hmm. than they would have before, right? So normally they would have come straight from high school into college and not really ha maybe had a part-time job. But recently, since all of that work was online, they started getting more full-time jobs. So now mm -hmm. they're making money, right? So they don't want to give up that job to come back and take seated classes. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, well, that's awesome for, for them to have that ability to do both. You know, it really expands what they can do. Um, let's see, what else do we want to talk about? So I'm very curious. One of the things then, that, we, yeah, go ahead. Caitlin, we did have a question come in. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if if now you know is is a good time um, to chat a little bit about it. But um, Janae um, Dennis, I hope I'm saying the name correctly, um, would like to know how maybe some of our faculty, some of our panelists here, are overcoming the issue of AI and some new technologies um, compromising online courses, maybe specifically you know, with your science courses and what unique methods you may be using to help combat um, students using AI uh, for you know, cheating and plagiarism purposes. So that is a remarkably hot topic now. I was only in recently introduced to it a few weeks ago and I tried one of the chat, bo chat bots. So I put in a prompt uh, something about, I think, photosynthesis, right? And I got a surprisingly accurate response from the AI. So then I clicked regenerate and I got a completely different response that was still accurate. So this is something new that I'm going to have to work on to figure out how to go about that. I haven't really delved into it much, um, but you're right. That is a huge aspect that we're going to have to work on uh, to figure that out. I would be happy to hear if anyone else has any experience dealing with that so far. So to say, yeah, to, to my end, you know, it's very interesting to see. And um, Marnie, my colleague who just uh, raised that question to us, um, and I were just talking about this last week about, I believe it's called Chatbot AI. 
And really the level of detail you can get from, from there is, is it's, it's astounding. It's astounding. And so when we think of, you know, traditional methods of working with students uh, to prevent plagiarism, like turn it in or um, a lot of the checkers, that's not going to get captured there. And it's really going to be a challenge moving forward. Um, I don't know if any of us know how to address it yet, um, but it is certainly um, a very hot topic right now. The, the biggest idea I could think about would be using alternative assessment methods, right? So for example, instead of writing a traditional couple paragraphs about something or a short answer, you could say, make an infographic about this topic, right? Or um, like I said, I had my students make a TikTok video last semester. So that I was surprised that students love doing that, right? Or you could do something more novel like that using other technologies that don't really work or as conducive to something like a written answer. That would be my my guess for how to work around that at this point until we get a chat bot for infographics, right? So yeah, for oh my goodness, that that's a great question. Thank you so much, Janae, for bringing that up today. Um, so I want to talk next about engagement and levels of engagement between your traditional and your non-traditional students. Um, when it comes to the online labs, are you seeing differences there? Or is there a similar level of engagement? I'm curious what you're seeing among our students. So in terms of engagement, can you clarify a little bit what you mean by that? Um, you know, class participation, um, um, you know, question answers. Um, are you seeing, you know, um, the, the students who are um, the, the traditional or the non-traditional, is there a difference in how they're engaging with the coursework, whether um, they're grasping it, grasping it more easily um, than one or one way or the other? Oh, so yeah. So I, I do think there is some amount of difference. And I think that goes back to time management, right? So when it comes to engagement, I, I would look at reports or analytics and my tra non-traditional students would access work earlier in the week than my traditional students would. So with that engagement, they would be engaged with it multiple times throughout the week, whereas my traditional students would typically wait more until the weekend, right? So I, I've tried to build in more support to get that um, engagement earlier on for my traditional students, but so far that has been an uphill battle. And I think as we progress more towards online in the future, that's something that we're going to have to build in, right? So you have to instill that early. So not just in my class, but in other classes, you need to engage early in the week. Um, what do you think, Sujata? Um, so my non-traditional uh, students are always, um, you know, uh, participating much, uh, much more frequently in my online class compared to traditional students. Um, and they, especially with online labs, uh, it is very important, especially for us in biology. It takes about, you know, three to four or even five days to complete a lab. And uh, uh, it is important that they get started uh, in the beginning of the week or beginning of the module in order to be able to complete it before the deadline. And uh, I have observed that uh, the non-traditional students are very good about keeping up with these deadlines, but the traditional students, uh, the percentage of them kind of falling behind is much higher. Um, and they also need, I feel, need more assistance from the instructors in order to complete these labs online uh, compared to the non-traditional ones. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so one of the things I mentioned earlier was that there are a number of students um, um, who are, would be considered more traditional student enrolling in fully online programs. Um, and so I'm curious, do you think we're gonna see that continue to uptick? Um, in, in this sort of post-pandemic landscape where now they know they can be fully online? Or do you think we will eventually see sort of that wraparound effect or that boomerang effect where they're, they'll be interested in coming back to campus? I think there'll always be some students who want to take classes in person, but I, I think as we're moving forward, online education is going to continue um, to increase in popularity. So one thing we have um, a, a question or comment um, from the audience, 
um, about online sections. And so one of our participants, uh, Harlan Fish, um, had noticed that um, their online sections are filling before the seated. Um, and he's wondering if it could be, uh, students think it'll be easier to cheat, but hopefully being a convenience. Um, do you see issues um, with cheating in your online sections versus your on campus? Yeah, with online classes, uh, um, you know, uh, plagiarism is always a challenge for uh, faculty to deal with. Um, that is why at SUNY Empire State, we have a lot of alternative assessments uh, where we have open-ended questions uh, which uh, students, uh, which reduces the chances of students cheating. Uh, so uh, all of our uh, online courses are designed in such a way that there is um, very minimal like exams or quizzes that are multiple choice questions. Mostly all the assessments are very open-ended. So the student has to actually perform an activity or uh, uh, put some thought into answering. So I think uh, it's going to be, continue to be challenging to address plagiarism in online classes, but by coming up with these alternative forms of assessments, I think we can reduce it. What about you, Chasen? Yeah, so um, as Shajatha said, I, I think it's always going to be an issue. Uh, one thing that happened in an online class of mine recently was I had a whole group that had data that was exactly the same, right? Which anyone who does research knows you're never going to have like eight people in a group, I mean, eight people in a class with all the same data, right? Exactly the same. So we use that as a teaching moment to talk a little bit about why you do things in replications, right? We talked a little bit about the ethics behind stuff like that. And that was a really good teachable moment for my students to talk, to kind of realize that, oh, the scientific method is not about getting this 100%, everybody gets the same aspect, right? But talking about why it's important to do things multiple times and why we have multiple people at multiple institutions working on the same thing, right? So then you can have this peer review effect. So I sort of use that as a teachable moment. And I think that helped. Well, in my mind, I hope it helps um, to try and curb that cheating for future experiments. Or they made it, they could have just, you know, made the data up going forward. But um, I didn't see that trend on, on subsequent assignments, which I, I was glad to see. What that what a great way to teach that. I really, I really like that um, approach because. A lot of our students, you know, whether they're traditional or non-traditional, don't have a lot of experience with the scientific process. And so um, that, that's really exciting to see how you address that. I like that um, a lot. Do either of you use um, photo submissions or video submissions um, for grading to help um, combat that so you know it's the students that are submitting the, the work that, 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 that they did? So I've done some video and some uh, photo assignments. Uh, I don't do them all the time, but I pick several throughout the semester. Photos I do every lab, but videos I do a couple times, typically on the labs for the lab kits that are a little more involved. Mm -hmm. So that way I can see that, oh, what their setup is like, you know, how are they engaging with it, that kind of thing. And that works pretty well. Uh, one of the issues that we mentioned earlier was technology, right? So I had to design some instructional videos on this is how you can take a video with your phone or that kind of thing. So show up, up some resources for that. But otherwise, it went pretty well. well that's great. Sujatha, do you do anything like that in your class? Yeah, so photos, like Cheston said, I do photos for every lab report. Uh, they have to submit photos. Uh, also, the credibility, I mean, the, of the photos, again, is challenging for the instructor to make sure that they are submitting the, uh, their photos from their experiments. So off and on, I do do videos of them actually doing the experiments, so, which they can include with their lab report. Uh, but I don't do it for every single lab because <laughs> it gets really too much for them. But I do do it off and on during the semester. And then another question from Janae, um, adjacent to the lab, is how do you guys facilitate your exams online when it comes to exam time? So we use a proctoring service. Uh, so students have a lockdown browser and then their webcam takes 
videos of them actually taking the exam. And then as they, if they look away from the screen too often or anything like that, uh, we'll get a flag and then we'll go back and watch the video to see how that was going. Um, like we mentioned, there are still ways to go around that, so we're working on that, but otherwise um, that's the best option we have at this particular time, I think. How about you, Sujata? Um, we use uh, uh, responders for Blackboard, and uh, if we use McGraw-Hill, for example, for any course that we are teaching, they have their own proctoring uh, inbuilt in their uh, exams, uh, which is free for the students. Uh, and that is one thing we commonly use, depending on whether the course is using the McGraw-Hill textbook or not. Um, and uh, as I said, at SUNY Empire State Online classes, there are very few exams that students take. Mostly it is a lot of alternative forms of assessments. Uh, so that is, uh, that is another uh, kind of we work around that to address plagiarism. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, really, um, I'm, I'm gonna want to revisit back to a statement you said, Chastin, where your school was really surprised by um, the uh, response to students um, on uh, wanting to be online. Um, do you anticipate you guys are going to continue to expand your online program? And I'm very curious at Empire State as well, Sujatha, are you guys looking to continue expanding your online science programs um, uh, in the future? Or, um, or are you gonna try and balance that with the online on-campus courses? I think for us, we're going to continue to explore it. And mm -hmm. then as we're going through that, um, still have some face-to-face -face classes, but I think we're looking at branching out into different courses and kind of teaching some online that haven't been taught in the past and try to meet the needs of our students. And Sujata? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, we have already increased uh, the number of sections of online uh, classes that we offer since the pandemic and our enrollment keeps increasing. Uh, so I think uh, SUNY Empire State will continue to expand their online program. Uh, as I said, even before uh, it was mostly online oriented uh, school uh, because uh, we, more, we, for the most part, cater to non-traditional students. Um, and uh, in the last one year, we have seen um, a lot of increase in enrollment, especially for chemistry and biology classes. And we offer, instead of one section, we are increasing the number of sections now. That's fantastic. That's awesome. So looking back on pre and post COVID, um, do, you, do you think that online education is here to stay with our traditional students? Do we think it's going to be long term or do you, or do you think that um, we're going to have some stickiness there? So I, I think it's probably here to stay. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I think there are people who will always prefer to have a, a seated class, but I think now that we've kind of opened the, this arena that it's going to keep going and uh, it's going to be kind of here to stay. I think one of the defining features for that will be how we combat this plagiarism issue, right? So that could be sort of the sink or swim aspect, how we can go about um, curbing that. Yeah, um, I think now the students have now more more uh, flexibility and more uh, opportunity to choose from uh, different plat platforms of learning. Um, and uh, online will definitely, I feel, stay. Um, I also feel like hybrid with traditional students, hybrid uh, uh, classes might become more popular where uh, the lecture is going to be online and lab in person. Um, but, you know, st students have so much, uh, so much flexibility, so many different options to choose from. Uh, I do not think that online will fade away, it, it will stay. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to jump back into our comments section and see we've got a couple more questions in there. Um, so one question that came up is how do you deal with students who have poor internet connections?
that is always a huge challenge. So I teach at a community college in a predominantly rural in, uh, area. So that's something that we had to deal with a lot shifting online. Prior to the pandemic, typically if people had very poor internet, they just didn't take online courses, right? But then we had that shift and then everyone was taking online classes. Uh, one thing we did as a college was we invested in those personal hotspots so people could check those out uh, and, and use that at their home. So if they did not have high-speed internet access, they would have that hotspot and that would allow them to have decent, uh, pretty decent uh, online access. So I think looking at ways to increase access like that is going to be helpful. Awesome. Another question that came up in here um, from Harlan was um, asking whether um, either of you had ever done a blended class with the lecture online, but the labs face to face or vice versa um, to use one of those situations as um, an opportunity to give exams um, when it kept circling back to that copyright and that plagiarism issue. Yeah, I teach hybrid classes where uh, the lecture is online and the lab is in person and I give the lecture exams during my lab time, um, which has, I mean, of course, that the main reason for me to do that is to address plagiarism. And uh, it has worked out pretty well so far. Um, and, uh, you know, most of my labs, they do not run the whole three hours. So I time the lab, uh, the lecture exam days in those shorter labs so that I don't compromise my lab time. Awesome. Yeah, so I often do blended or hybrid classes as well. Typically what I've done is, as uh, Sajatha says, lecture online, lab in person. Next semester, I'm trying one um, where lecture is online, half of the lab is online, half of the lab is in person. So we had a response from one particular program on campus that has a high number of clinical hours. They still wanted it hybrid, so some face-to-face -face time but they wanted, they needed a shorter lab time in person. So I'm gonna do part of the lab online as well. So we're gonna see how that works uh, next semester. Well, that's a really interesting approach. Have either of you done anything with HyFlex where you do the same labs on campus or at, and as well as at home? I have not tried a HyFlex class. No, I have not tried it as well. Fantastic. Um, we would love if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat or into the Q&A section. Um, um, we're happy to answer any other questions you guys might have this afternoon. One other question that came up was, um, are there any other forms of assessments that you guys use in your laboratory classes beyond sort of that typical uh, lab report? So I haven't really experimented as much with alternative assessments in lab as much as uh, what we traditionally do. And part of that is the fact that we use a lab kit, right? So much of that is already pre-designed. And I don't want to add another component to that where it's like, in addition to this lab, you're going to do this other kind of assessment. Because I find that if you have too many types of assessments, right, so it can be overwhelming for students because they might think, oh, I did the lab online, so I don't need to do this other extra thing. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of avoided that at this particular time. So what I do is uh, at the end of the semester, I ask my, apart from the lab reports that they uh, complete during, uh, ev after every experiment, at the end of the semester, I ask them to choose one lab uh, that they uh, really enjoyed or, um, you know, that they learned from the most. And I ask them to make a video or a presentation or a poster, uh, whatever form that they like. And uh, I ask them to present it to the class um, with, with their data and everything has to be uh, from their actual experiment. And uh, 
uh, you know, like a hypothesis. So basically following all the steps of uh, scientific method. And I have found out that they really like this assessment because at the end of the semester, they get to kind of reflect on what they have learned and uh, they're also able to present it to their peers. So that way, um, you know, uh, uh, it is something that I do in my microbiology class. Well, that's awesome. That sounds like a fun one. One we have in here from the pa uh, Heather um, shared that uh, they do a lab practical um, with uh, students submitting three videos demonstrating lab skills and a screenshot along with more traditional matching and short answer tests. So that I thought was really interesting as well and I thought was a great approach. Um, here, oh, here's a great question from Devin for you guys. How do you deal with some programs not accepting online labs? So I haven't had that issue as much with my classes. I know that a lot of my students are local to this particular area. So really for us, you there would be no way for the uh, sort of transfer institution to know if it was online uh, since most of my students live in this particular area with the college themselves. And our transcript doesn't differentiate between online and in person. So I haven't dealt with that as much. I do think that lab kits help with that some and the fact that they are doing hands-on experiments so I, I can see that maybe if you provided a syllabus or something and sort of information about the lab kit component that might help yeah same for us uh, on the transcript there is no differentiation whether the student has taken an in-person class or an online class uh, so the school where they transfer to has no way to know what kind of modality they took. Um, so maybe in the future, uh, there will be some distinction. This is like an ongoing discussion at our uh, school also, like um, what is the, you know, when, what is the transferability of online classes? And I don't think there is a solid answer for this. Interesting. Okay, um, we'll be happy to take any other questions that you all may have this afternoon. If you want, you can add them to the chat or to the Q&A box um, before we wrap things up. Give it another few minutes. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions come in. So first of all, I wanna thank Chestin and, oh, uh, Chestin and Sujatha for joining us today really appreciate your guys' time and your expertise on um, your experiences in teaching traditional and non-traditional students online. Um, and we also wanna thank you for attending with us today. Um, we know it is a very busy time of year or in the middle of finals or the end of finals and just starting to grade. Um, so we do appreciate you taking out time out of your schedules before the holidays um, to join us. Thank you so much for joining our panel discussion um, and have a wonderful holiday season. And uh, and a happy new year. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much.